Yeah, Jody already had it. She has Bailey's with her coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's our inspiration. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Ian to introduce Holly to us this morning. And we will go from there. Sure. Well, good morning. Can everybody hear me okay now? Okay, beautiful. So, um, Holly, first of all, thank you for joining us. This is a, a unique platform that we're on, so I'm glad that you are able to join us. Please bear with us as this is kind of a new thing. Um, so, for everyone who's here, Holly joined the Institute for Stat, Stat Hunting Treatment and Research in 1994. Um, she's had various roles there, ranging from a clinician to adult clinic and training coordinator, um, clinical director, acting executive director, and now she is the clinical director the clinical director for iStar. Um, her clinical interests include evidence-based treatment for stuttering, um, providing professional training for SLP stu 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 students and clinicians who are in fluency programs. Um, Affect that effective communicate, communicate, communication workshops. Okay. Um, Holly has presented to fellow SLPs at various um, conferences around the world, both in America, Canada, England, and there has has been an international international fluency conference as well. Um, she's done multiple research programs, which have, has allowed her work to be published in speech language pathology journals, as well as textbooks too. Um, in 2008, she, she received the award for the Clinical Excellence, which is run by, by the Alberta Rehab Council. Um, she's trained in the Comprehensive Stuttering Program, the Lidcombe Stuttering Treatment, uh, Parent-Child Interaction Solution Focused Brief ther ther Therapy, Camper Down, and she's fully trained with the Speech Easy device, which is kind of like a hearing aid that you can put in your ear and it, um, it, it'll take the sound that you hear and delay it and change the frequency, which has really cool effects on speech. And I have have one. I don't use it very often. Perhaps I should, but I don't. Um, ultimately, Holly has had a positive impact on countless children and adults alike throughout her career, including my own, back in 2001, where she helped me find my voice. And I have, I still have waves, and I think I will throughout my entire life, but um, Holly really has helped that, and I know that I'm not the, on, the only one. So Holly, thank you. Thank Every you. time I see you, it, uh, <laughs> it brings it all back, and my, <laughs> my rate slows down, and I can really, it's bizarre how the psychological impact is there. So it is great. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Holly to the group. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do apologize for the lengthy bio, but I have been working for 25 years. <laughs> so I guess I kind of uh, earned those you're the long paragraph, but um, thanks so much, Ian. It is a real pleasure to speak again to the Rotary Club. I actually spoke to this club, I think it was a couple of years ago. It was lovely summer. We were in the golf course. The food was fantastic. The company was great. So I'm really glad to come again. I'm just sorry that we could not be in person, but um, maybe another time. So I have not shared my presentation through Zoom before. So this is a new thing for me. I'm hoping that uh, 
it will go smoothly and everybody will be able to see it fine. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to give it a try. So is everybody able to see that? Yeah, good, perfect. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna start with just some of our beautiful staff. <laughs> so this is just a photo of our current staff that we have right now. Um, this actually was taken from my 25 year celebration. So that's just a little bit of shout out to my wonderful team for supporting me in that. But I wanna tell you a little bit about iStar. And I know that there are some people in the crowd that know about us um, and have actually had the good opportunity to come to one of our final speeches events. So what happens in our therapy is we always provide uh, in our intensive group and provide an opportunity for clients at the end of three weeks of therapy to do a presentation uh, and we invite people in to see that. We always show a pre-treatment and a post-treatment video so people can have a bit of perspective about what actually goes on in that person's life. So what I wanted to do is something a bit different. I want you to take a listen to one of our clients. Now bear in mind this client was from quite a few years ago. It is a bit of a long video so I may not play at all but I want you to have the experience as though you're coming to one of the final speeches. So we are going to see this video and I'm going to play it for not not the whole time but play it for a little bit so you get a perspective of what you're listening to. What school are you at? Go to Emmy Lazar. Okay, good. All right, so tell me about your stuttering. Um, how is it for you? How does it affect you? Um, it's very um um there <laughs> it's very um there pressing and i It's very hard to talk with people, and sometimes I have to write what I want to say, and it makes me sad and ashamed. So that's just a little bit of a sample that we took from this particular client. At the time he was 16 going to high school. I thought if we were in person, I would have us all kind of take a moment to think about that sample. But rather than getting everybody's thoughts on it because we're all wanting to mute our, our mics, I'm just gonna have you think about what were the things that you heard there? And what did you see visibly that told you that there was something going on from a perspective where there was struggle? And then I want you to also reflect on what you didn't see and hear, but you just heard from the words that he was saying what you might have surmised might be going on for somebody who is having a stutter like this. And what that does is helps us to have an understanding of what is actually happening when people are stuttering. We know that stuttering, a lot of the definitions, uh, I should just preface that to say what is stuttering, really just describe the characteristics or behavior, the experience of it. And we don't really have a working de uh, definition that 
we're quite 100% solid with because we still don't know yet the actual cause. We're going to talk about a definition in a minute, what some of our research in the field have come up with. And I, I chose it to talk about because I feel like it probably describes it the best way. But we often talk about stuttering with the analogy of an iceberg. And what happens with stuttering is that the things you see above the waterline, if you will, those are what we call overt behaviors. So behaviors that we can notice. So you probably noticed in that, that sample that there was a really long time before that person was starting to speak. Sometimes that's thinking, but for many clients who stutter, that's blocking, which is where they're trying to get their voice to start. It's just taking a really long time. So they might be working really hard to get the vocal folds to open again so that they can get phonation. So it could be also a fleeting moment of stoppage where the blocking is like that, or it could be what you saw where they were very long moments. We also see repetitions in that sample. You saw where there was a repetition of either a whole word rep or a part rep, part word repetition, where it might be something like that or, or, or something like that. We also have phrase reps. So the repetitions, the blocking, Holding sounds too long, that's another sound example of a behavior for stuttering, where instead of saying Saturday, a person might say Saturday. There might also be hesitations, there might also be what people do to help themselves move out of a block, and we call those fillers or interrupters, where you might hear ums and uhs. Lots, some clients have this long, um, routine of saying three or four words just to get them going to get out of that block or to get themselves started. So those are the behaviors that we see. We also see, and you probably have seen some struggle on the face where there might be, um, you know, uh, eyebrow frowning or head movement. We might see those things. We call those still overt behaviors, but the behaviors that are core stutters are the blocks, the repetitions, the prolongations. The things that you probably didn't see and hear were the, what we call covert behaviors. And those behaviors are things that are we, they're covered, if you will. That's a good way to remember that. So what's covered and what's maybe below that waterline, if we go back to our iceberg analogy, are the things that people do to try to cope with this. So the avoiding speaking, averting gaze so that they don't need to see the reaction of the person they're speaking with if they do stutter. Other nonverbal mo movements that talk about, um, that maybe reflect some of the tension that that person is feeling at the time. It's those covert behaviors that uh, can wreak a lot of havoc for people's emotional well-being. Well so we've got overt behaviors, we've got covert behaviors, and what stuttering really encompasses is both that physical manifestation of interruption with the motor system, but also in conjunction, it's the emotional responses to those struggles that then can lead to severe avoidance behaviors to the point of isolation. So avoidance can be, I'm just not gonna go to that party, I don't feel comfortable, I'm an introvert, or it can be, I'm not gonna say that word because it's too hard for me, I'll use a synonym. It can even be avoiding to the point where people will change their names. I've got many clients who say, oh, a whole city knows me as Vincent and my name is John. It's, I don't, I can't even do that. Some people have legally changed their names as well. So there's lots of um, things people will do, the lengths they will go to, to avoid. One of the ones that I remember always as a, a pretty severe length to avoid was a young man in, in high school who had to do a presentation, but was so terrified to do that brought out his EpiPen that he usually uses to help himself in really bad allergic reactions and injected himself with that EpiPen. And of course was rushed to the hospital because he was not having an episode of allergy responses and he was, it was very serious for him. But he afterwards, when he reflected on that, he said, I would do it again. It was worth it to me to get out of that situation because that would have been so uh, socially harmful to me to speak and stutter and have that listener reaction that I feared. So there are really extreme lengths that people will go to to uh, remove themselves from that social harm. So even though I told you before we don't really know what is stuttering, we know a lot about it, but we know particularly what it isn't. And it's not a psychological disorder. It's not about 
um, nervousness. So a lot of times people say, well, you're just nervous. Most of us get nervous too, and we don't stutter. So it's not the condition of nervousness that creates the stuttering. Certainly it can make the problem more difficult, but it's not the thing that is the etiology of it. We know it's not a language disorder. We know that the speech motor center is being impacted and the language center is in a different part of the brain. But we also know that some people who do stutter have language concerns. That doesn't necessarily mean though that it is what's causing the stuttering. We also know that it's not an indication of intelligence. In fact, most of the people who I know who stutter are quite intelligent because they need to be. They need to be doing mental gymnastics with vocabulary so that they can do these elaborate word switches and not make no sense at all. So there, there is a, a, an element there of people's vocabulary being quite strong. We know that it's not a result of trauma. Some people will say that they didn't stutter until a divorce happened in the family or they didn't stutter until they were, I had one client say, I was, I was startled by a snake when I was three years old and I think that's what caused this. That certainly can be the trigger that can help the stuttering to come to light, but we know that it's, it's not a result of trauma. So what, what do we know, you might ask? So, but we do know that it's, it seems to be a genetic disorder, that there is some hereditary factors, certainly, and that the DNA is impacted for people who stutter. What we don't know is how that actually gets triggered. So lots of clients will say, no, nope, I'm the first one in my family and nobody else stutters. Or they might say, um, well, actually, yes, my great grandfather, you know, he stuttered for a long time. So I think it's in the family. We do think it is in the family. Um, how it comes to light and what, how it gets turned on or not is still a bit of a mystery. We know it impacts the speech motor part of the brain, which is in the left temporal region of the brain. We know that it impacts about 1% of our population, which seems like a small number until, you know, we've been talking about the COVID virus and people are saying, well, 2% mortality, that's small. When it impacts the number of people for population, it's not actually that small. So 1% of the population is quite a bit for people. We know that more biological males are impacted than biological females, but we're not quite sure why that is. But we do tend to see about two to one ratio in um, the population of people who stutter. At our clinic, we see about four to one. We see about four more males than we do females. And we also know that it impacts all aspects of a person's life. Communication is something that impacts everything we do. Many clients will say, oh, I stutter. So I went into computers so I wouldn't have to talk to people. And then they get in that workplace and they're like, oh, I didn't realize how much I had to talk to people. There's communication as part of our life. It's integral to that. It helps us what helps us be human. So it does impact all aspects of one's life. This is a very lengthy definition and I'm not going to go too detailed into it, but I thought I would just say uh, how this is all brought together. As I said before, we don't really know, but we do think that stuttering is a result of a neurological, physiological problem that's affecting the planning part of the brain. So I always say it in layman's terms, it's a pre prior to motor movement, speech planning problem and coordination problem. It can also be impacting language and speech. So for that verbal execution, when there's interruptions in that, so for the blocking we saw, the word repetitions and struggle, that's, that's what we see. But we don't always know what's going on underneath until we talk with clients. So what that is going on underneath is those reactions that are emotional to that moment of, of disfluency. And depending on the individual, those reactions can be mild and they can be severe. So we can have a mild stutterer, with, which we see is, oh, well, yeah, your stuttering isn't that bad. And clients will say all the time, oh, I, come, I wanna come for therapy, but my coworkers, my family, they say I'm pretty mild, but yet this is impacting me is significantly. So it's the mild moderate of it can be overt and it can be covert. So when we do therapy, we're looking at the whole person because we believe that to be important. Um, so yeah, it impacts all parts of people's lives. It impacts academic performance. So lots of people are under um, evaluated, I suppose is the best way to say it, who pretend they don't know the answers, who often have an I don't know, who will take a zero so that they don't have to do the participation part of class. We know that it is, um, lots of these kids are vulnerable to um, being under 
educated, I guess, or having that ability to do what they want to do or what they're capable of doing. Many, many of our clients are underutilized when it comes to employment. So vocationally, they're doing things that they really uh, are well able to do more. So people are working as janitors, there's working in jobs, you know, that are they are great jobs, but that they could be doing something where they might be utilizing more of that uh, ability, might be doctor or, or teacher. They really want to be a teacher. They just don't think they can do it. So there's lots of um, impact on employment choices and not just in choices from the person who stutters, but also from the people who are interviewing them, who don't think they have the capabilities because they have disfluencies in their speech. So there is still, despite uh, rules for discrimination, there's still lots of that happens in job interviews where people just aren't asked back. And so, you know, that's a big, that's a big impact on our society and whole at whole in the whole. Um, social interactions are impacted relationship building. There's a lot of concern right now in the field that people who stutter who are teens, adults, and some children even are experiencing a high degree of social anxiety and depression that there seems to be within this population many more than the normal population of, of people who experience social anxiety. And in fact, there is a call for most of the clients who are adults, teens to be screened for social anxiety when they come in for therapy because the, it's such a big concern. Lots of suicide ideation for some of the teens who are really experiencing a great deal of teasing and bullying. And one of the things that I think since my career started that I've seen change and not for the better, is the bullying experiences of clients because of cyberbullying. It used to be that they could go home and have a safe spot, but social media follows us everywhere. And so there's lots of uh, people dealing with that. So uh, social interactions, relationships, in fact, even just with the family, I've had many people say, my family don't know me. They don't want to take the time to hear me talk because it just takes too long. So there's there's lots of um, limiting or missed opportunities to build really robust relationships for people who stutter. Self-esteem is impacted, uh, as you can imagine, and confidence. And confidence is one of those sort of nebulous ideas of how do you describe it? What is it actually? How do we get more of it? And, you know, lots of clients will talk about when they're more confident, they're more fluent. And we don't know why that is. We don't know how that really impacts their speech motor center, but certainly that is what's happening. And so we try to help people feel confident despite whether or not they're having disfluencies. So that's part of the treatment program. I thought I would just uh, read, a, have you look at a few of these uh, comments from clients themselves. So when I stuttered, I was nauseous before I was to speak, and then I felt guilty about it. And then I was ashamed and confused and angry and frustrated when I spoke. So this was just really, when we asked people, how do you feel about your stuttering? This was just an excerpt from one of our assessments that tell you just the impact emotionally. Another one, there were so many experiences in my early years that I missed out on because I hid under the rock known as stuttering. And the last, if I had two wishes, one would be to say my name and the other would be to read to my sons. So some of these things that we take for granted, going to Starbucks and getting a coffee and not saying our name and reading a book to our children and things that seem to be just small things are huge for somebody who stutters and has a communication problem. And so that's, it's humbling to hear these stories for us and reflect on, on my life to say, what is so easy? I want to order a pizza. I pick up the phone and order. That's not the case for some people who stutter. So how did we all start? So uh, I did start in 1994, but I started in 1986. So, and it was really a dream to help people who stutter speak clearly and have confidence. And our founder was a person who stuttered himself. His name was Einar Boberg, and he was a speech pathologist. And so he really went through his own journey of doing speech therapy and tried things that worked and tried things that didn't work. And he was just, there's wanted to come up with something that was going to be better for people. And so he developed the comprehensive stuttering program, which looks at integrating. And at the time, this was very novel. So what they did is they integrated managing stuttering behaviors through fluency skills, which they were doing out in Australia back in the 80s. 
but he also was bringing in the idea of let's talk about attitudes and positive changes to our attitudes so that we can be more confident as speakers and let's put that together and although that seems to be sort of a no-brainer at this point in our careers it's it was really uh, groundbreaking at the time to to integrate both of those ideas and to have a program that was encompassing the whole of a person and which interesting to me is that we still go to conferences where there's still polarizing and unfortunately I feel like there's polarizing in all aspects of our lives now but there's this polarized idea of you can either manage your stuttering behaviors through fluency skills or you can work on accepting that you stutter and for us at iStar we've never had that conflict we've always said why can't we do both? We're not saying that we don't like to hear stuttering and there's something wrong with it, but we're saying maybe if you want to make stuttering and, and speech easier and without so much effort and you can enjoy it more, let's to show you some things that will help. And let's also talk about how you can accept it and say, this is a part of me and I don't need it to be a negative part. And so that therapy approach is our house program. We do that at iStart, along with other evidence-based treatments that have come in the field since then that our therapists are trained for so that our clients, most importantly, have options. And as we're all individuals, not one program is going to fit everybody. So we do find with our comprehensive stuttering program that we make modifications if we need to. We come up with different ideas. It's not that we um, are so biased that we have to be married to this program. We're very open to say, what will the client benefit from the most? And what opportunities can I provide to them so that we can help them reach the goals they have in their life? So yeah, we, we started in 86 and Einer was our founder. He came up with, I started actually started uh, in a really unique way. So his program, his therapy approach started earlier than that in his own learnings. But he uh, one day was having a research study. So while Einer was the chair of the department in at University of Alberta for speech pathology, he had a research a program that he was doing. And that research program was what now is the comprehensive stuttering program with such good results for the research year after year that he just thought, I got to make this something more permanent. And Deborah Cully, who was our co-founder, was a student of his when she started. And so they just decided, yeah, this was something worthwhile. We've had such good results from our treatment outcomes that maybe we can make this happen. But the university was not able to give any money, as they are now, not able to give any money to us. And the government wasn't willing to give any money to Einer. And so he was a bit stuck in what he was going to do and just it was a chance meeting at Fairmont Hot Springs when he was in the hot spring and he started to speak with the person next to him who was an elk member and he said this is my cause and the elk said we want something to support and together they they worked so that we could actually start the first institute in 1986. In 2004, so even though we were um, uh, affiliated with the university from the beginning, we became an official institute within the university's faculty of rehabilitation medicine in 2004. It's a bit confusing. We were always called the Institute for Stuttering Treatment Research in its inception, but the institute was also our sort of category name that we have as well. However, what's unique about us is that we are a nonprofit and we are self-funded. So although we fit under the institute for the university's qualifications where we do research, we train students, we teach, um, and we support community, we don't get any budget from the university. So we rely only on donor fees and we rely on our own um, uh, sort of client pay fee for service that we have. So the university supports us in ways like rent and uh, IT support, but those gifts in kind, um, things will very likely change under this new government. So we're, we're a little bit in a bit of a, as I said earlier in the meeting when we were talking, a bit of a no man's land. The university thinks of us as a bit of a nonprofit and the government thinks of us as a university program and we're sort of stuck in the middle. We're not really either one of those. But what we do to make a difference in the lives of people stutter are kind of four main pillars. We provide treatment. We do treatment that has, we, were, we always say that we were evidence-based before we knew what that word was. <laughs> everything now is evidence-based, but we started as a research study. So everything we do, all the data we collected from 32 years ago, 
was put into data collection and research write-ups. So we, we do have results to say that what we do in therapy makes a difference. And we have uh, long-term studies to say that, that people after therapy are still satisfied. So that's one of our main pillars. We also, Einer's dream was that other people who get therapy from different people in the world, not ISTAR, get good therapy. So we do professional training for students and we do also professional training for practicing speech pathologists so that we are giving back to the, the community. Yes, we believe that the work we do is good, but we also want to be collegial and help. Really, it's about helping these children and teens and adults get what they need. We do research into the cause and nature of stuttering. So we do, we've always done that even when we didn't have research budget and we still don't really have a research budget, but we always contribute to research. And we are uh, interested in doing public education and building awareness so that people in the community, like people in Rotary clubs and other places, learn about us and understand that maybe if they uh, have a person they know in their lives who's needing help that now they know where they could recommend they come. And then also just so when you meet another person who stutters, you understand it a little bit more. And what difference will it make to people's lives if we do this, if they can have improved speech? Obviously improve well-being, emotional well-being. That's such a huge part of our lives right now. You're always hearing buzzwords about, you know, mindfulness and well-being and mental wellness and balance. It's absolutely true. Uh, the impact of the social isolation of being a person who stutters can impact lots of that emotional well-being. So that will improve, improve quality of life. I can maybe look at having hope to get the job I want, to have that relationship I want. Um, maybe I have more opportunities to advance in my work and to get promoted. And what's interesting is my clients who now are promoted in their jobs, they'll say, I've noticed a real improvement with my speech as I've gotten promoted because I'm now in a position where people have felt that they could trust that I could do it. And so confidence grows. And then with that, we have increased contributions to society. So if you imagine a group of people whom if they didn't get any help, are more vulnerable to depression, more vulnerable to anxiety, not being educated the way they, they really are capable of being educated, vocationally are being underemployed, all of those things, what difference that makes to society at, at large and what would make the difference if they had opportunities. So now after you know, working with clients for this long, I've been able to see the arc of their lives. So working with teens and then I, they become back to me as an adult and then they come back to me with their children. So it's sort of this arc. And what I've seen is that these people are doctors, they're lawyers, they're um, teachers, they're in professions that are making a difference to us as a result of having therapy. So that's pretty exciting. So this is just a comment from one of our uh, teen clients, uh, parents of one of our teen clients, stuttering stole her childhood. She was a master of avoidance, but now gets up in front of a crowd and speaks. She even joined the school play. Thanks to iStar, she can be the best she can be. And this particular uh, uh, little client, she's not little anymore, she's ready to graduate, but she, uh, they thought she wasn't functioning the way she should have with her academics. They actually were worried about her being left behind. Mom was very worried about her depression because she was social isolating. And since she had therapy, she has traveled and exchange programs. She's really active in her girl guides. She's become a leader for that group. There's, she's really just moving herself forward in life, which is exciting to see. Another one, the ISTER program changed everything for me. Now I have hope. So what we do for treatment programs, uh, so we are, our, our, our clinicians are specialists in fluency work. So we all have to learn about fluency in our training, but uh, all of us who work at ISTAR have more hours of training and fluency than other speech pathologists who are working in schools or uh, health units. So we help children and their families, teens, adults, manage their stuttering, improve their fluency of all ages. Two to our oldest client came in to see us when he was 82. So a real range. Um, Evidence-based treatment is done in individual sessions or we do it in group therapy, we do intensives or refreshers. And uh, as we're talking about remote, we've, all, we've actually started doing remote therapy at ISTAR way back in, 
Oh my gosh, I'm going to say before 2000, so the late 90s, we were starting the very first part of telepractice. It's now moved to be called virtual care, but uh, it's something that we've been comfortable with for many, many years. And I currently have a client who lives in Afghanistan and he's not able to receive any therapy at all. So we do treatment via distance and we've been you know, comfortable to do that. Our clinicians are really great at individualizing therapies so that that meets the best needs. And I told you earlier that we're flexible to do programs that work, whatever works for that person. Um, this is just an, a bit of a, an example of some of our, our therapists working. And we do research. So Dr. Tortolokes is our research director and he works closely with our clinical team. He's also a professor in the Department of Speech Pathology. So we, we are uh, collaborating on research ideas. So therapists who work at ISTAR are also researchers. We don't have a lot of time to do the ethics and to do the write-ups, but we, we do do that actually in our own time for many of the projects that we've been working on. So we have our director, but we are, we are collaborating with him. And we also collaborate with other schools so, uh, and other places around the world. Because stuttering is a pretty niche area of working, there are, a lot of us know each other really well, so there's lots of collaboration that can happen. And then we take those studies and we go to different places to present the work that we're doing. I mentioned earlier, we do clinical training. So we have intensive programs that we run throughout the year where we bring in students, not just from the University of Alberta, who are graduating from their master's degree, but from University of Toronto, Western Ontario. We've had students from uh, Holland and Nijmegen in Holland. Uh, Germany, Lithuania, Scotland, many places, lots of places in the States who those students come to us because it's a very unique opportunity and it's uh, very few programs like ours are out there. So we, we do have a lot of people traveling to us. It's a very well thought out uh, clinical training program. So we have, we often, every year we turn people away. We just don't have enough clients that we can see that all these, these people who want to get trained can get training. But we have opened up in the last couple of years two-day workshops for practicing clinicians to learn about our program and to get a bit more extra training in fluency work. And we also do consultation uh, programs. We, we're consulting all the time, but people can actually be followed on a case with us if they want to do that. So we want to give back to that community uh, so that those kids can get the good therapy that they need. And then public education, as we said. So we work to do many presentations like this. We have media events. We, um, we, before we were part of the institution, or sorry, the Institute for fa in the faculty, when we have support from our communication department there, we always were doing this. We always did media. We always did things even before. So it's, a, it's close to our heart to let people know about that help is out there. Um, we also welcome our volunteers. We rely heavily on volunteers to help us do our work because our, one of the things that makes us different is in our therapy programs, we do establish fluency, like many other programs can do that, but we don't stop there. We take that fluency from the clinic room and we move it into uh, the real world experience as we call those transfer. So we have clients doing all kinds of things. They're starting with conversations, phones, they do simulated classrooms. We bring real teachers in to do that. We also have them do whatever is relevant to their lives. So uh, we had somebody who was a teacher. So we went to a school and he was allowed to make a couple announcements on the PA, uh, things like that. So whatever could be creative, we, we try to do that. So that's functional for the client. Uh, so, which is pretty exciting. So those volunteers help us to do that by being audience members or, or role play. They get their acting chops going and they, they, one time we had a doctor and we had a volunteer pretend she had a cardiac arrest and he had to come in and support that. So they, we have lots of things that we do to help the person prepare. We don't just do stuttering though. I think this is something that people need to be aware of because it only affects the 1% of the population. Our clinicians are speech pathologists foremost. So we do articulation, language, motor speech, voice, social training for adults, teens, children. We do all whatever else a speech pathologist might do. We also see that under our communication improvement program umbrella. So that's part of us as well. We have school contracts that we do via distance. Um, we also have other um, uh, events that we put on. So we have accent modification. 
accent reduction, public speaking, academic preparation, and art of conversation workshops that we hold. Not for people who stutter necessarily, but for people who maybe just want to improve their communication abilities. So, uh, and or see as if they don't want to do in a workshop, which is a group format, we also see them individually. So um, that's been an interesting addition add on to our, to our work. So I always, people always ask, what can we do to help? And so how can you do that? Well, although we aim to keep our fees as low as possible, we still rely on donations because there's a bit of a shortfall. For so every dollar we charge a client because we wanna keep the fees in keeping with what they can afford, it actually costs us, I did the math once and it was actually cost us $1.54 to deliver the therapy. So we're, we're working at um, you know, a razor thin budget basically to be able to support clients and, but you know, we can't really charge them what it really costs to do therapy. So we rely on our generous donors and they have been wonderful, wonderful throughout the years to really support that. We have two funds that are available for people. One's called the iStar Client Assistance Program. And those are for people who are, have lots of financial need. There's very strict metrics about that. They need to demonstrate the, the need and with documentation. But we also have now launched a new program. It's very new. I don't even think Ian knows about it. It's called the I Client Support, yeah, I Star Client Support Fund, and that fund um, can help people if they've exhausted their ICAP. They can go to this other fund as well because um, there is a cap on some of those ICAP funds. That if they've gotten five thousand dollars from us, they need to wait before they get another amount so that we're fair to other clients. So this I Star Client Support Fund are for those people who, a uh, client of mine who came last year, got some funding, came from PEI, severe young man, needs another intensive and has can't get it again from ICAP. He has, otherwise he'd have to wait and he's graduating this year. So the iStar Client Support Fund can help him um, because he's in, in great need. So we're, we're really working at whatever we can do to support people. We also need volunteers. So lots of people um, find this really interesting work. And so they'll come and volunteer to be conversation partners or audience members. And then it's word of mouth, really letting people know, you know, that we're out there, that we exist, that there is donor funds available. So, you know, if you come across someone who's struggling a little bit, or you notice that they might be helped through our work, then, you know, please uh, let them know about us. And so I want to just finish with you seeing that young man that you saw before. And this is three weeks after he saw that first video. And this is him in our final speech event. He's talking in front of about 40 or 50 people. Hi, my name is Emmanuel. I want to talk a little bit about my experiences with study and how I Star has changed me. Throughout my life, I've learned to cope with my speech and with being a person who studies. But it was most recently that it has had a huge impact on me and my lifestyle. Looking back, it was when I entered high school that my speech was becoming more and more severe. This was because I was beginning to care so much more about how others thought about me and the way I talked. It got to the point that for most of this past school semester, I avoided asking or answering questions in all of my classes. This had a huge impact on my grades Sorry, I know that we're going over, so I'm, I'll stop it there. But that gives you a picture of what he was able to accomplish. So I'll just close with this quote by Daniel Webster. If I were to lose all my possessions with exception, without exception, I would choose to keep communication. For with it, I could regain all that I had lost. So we welcome referrals. We welcome you to come and visit us when we <laughs> are lifting our social distancing. If you're interested in participating as an audience member in one of our final speech events, um, please do let me know. Uh, and I'll put you on the guest list. Um, and there's more information on our website for financial assistance if that's uh, something that, if you know somebody who would benefit from that. So I'm just gonna stop sharing my presentation at this point and uh, go back to uh, opening the floor up to any questions you might have. Do, does anybody have any questions? I don't know if a good point, way to do that is to just shout it out. <laughs> okay, 
Great. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I really appreciate being able to come and talk to you. Um, I'll leave now Ian to take over or Anne to take over. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so Holly, what we normally do is we make <clears throat> we make um, a donation to uh, Rotio's, Ro Rotio's, Rotary's Polio Plus program, which is one of our signature programs in the world to eradicate polio. So we will do that in your name. Oh, we will you. get you a certificate in due course. Thank and you so thank you very much for coming out this morning. I really appreciate that. That's so kind. Would I, I don't know if you've got regular business, so um, I'm happy to be told to leave if I need to. <laughs> you can stay. We just have a, a few announcements to go through, Perfect. but um, okay. not thank as exciting you. as your speech. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Actually, I do have so, one question, um, if I yeah. could interject really quickly. Um, and I'm not sure, I do see Jennifer on, but um, this might be a question for Jennifer and the club, but is it something that our club would be able to maybe in our next budget year to look at providing some support um, if Holly, uh, you know, approaches us? I'm not sure. hear me because I've never been on this before so um, it, we would ask Holly to um, go online and fill in the application so then it can be vetted by the, by the committee. Okay great thank you so much. Is there a, a time frame that you have um, applications in for support? Is, do you have a our, our deadline this year was March 1st, but we, we are extending it. So if you can um, go online onto our website and then just download it and, and then there's a contact to send it to me, uh, Jen McCurdy at shaw.ca and any of the Rotarians that you're in contact can give you my email address. We'll certainly look at it. Perfect. Thank you I, so much. My just uh, it's of great interest to me. My dad was a stutterer. Um, mm -hmm. He actually we found out he actually um, that uh, movie that was the King's um, <laughs> movie. My dad my dad lived in England and actually went to that doctor as a child. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, in school, he was told that in his report card he might become he might do okay if he could learn to talk. Um, and he ended up becoming a chartered accountant, one of the founders of Mohawk Law, and an MLA in, in uh, BC, and the Stutterers oh. Association in BC have a grant uh, in his name, so. That is fantastic. I'd love to talk to you more about that one uh, another time. That's so interesting, wow. Well, thank you. And Holly, I'm just gonna throw in, I've got a really good friend by the name of Travis Peter. He's, I don't know, he's both. Just he's young. <laughs> he, um, he went to iStar and uh, I know it changed his life a lot. I, I love going out with him because after a few beers, he's not quite as bad of a stutterer. <laughs> it calms him down. But he's got a young son now that is stuttering. And I think um, his experience has put him and his, and his wife at ease that they know that there's actually a lot of hope out there through iStar. So yeah, so thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, that's very kind. Okay, any more questions for Holly? Great. I'll mute my mic then. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ian, for organizing this. Um, <clears throat> President's announcements. The gala is postponed. The music festival is cancelled. And uh, breakfast at Sturgeon Valley is off until after Easter. Uh, interesting. So, um, basically those those are my announcements um i'm going to hand it over to mark just to talk briefly about uh, what he's doing with postponing the gala we had a lovely conversation on wednesday evening and talked about some next steps about the the gala um thankfully all of all of the suppliers are very understanding and have said um that they're um more than pleased to, well, not pleased, but uh, willing to uh, move things forward until we decide on dates. Uh, we're gonna go through the auction items and figure out what's there, what needs to be canceled, what needs to be returned, what we can store in uh, Laszlo's back warehouse, um, and uh, then kind of wait on COVID-19. Um, 
we talked a bit about uh, the, the rib fest and um, again, depending on how long COVID is circulating in the community, we may need to cancel that one as well. So we started talking about um, other fundraising opportunities and I know that this isn't unique to our club, but um, uh, we're going to start exploring uh, some other options. Um, and um, Laszlo made the comment at uh, the meeting that in our current economic situation, um, likely folks aren't going to be as uh, able to be as generous as they have been in the past. So um, we as a club may need to start evolving towards um, our, instead of contributing financially, we find other ways to support. And uh, um, because of social isolation, um, you can't uh, take on a lot of the sweat equity stuff unless it's something you're doing in your house and sending out to somebody. They sterilize it and then circulate those items. So um, interesting challenge going forward, but um, um, we're looking at that. The, the positive is the flag program um, and that one's starting to boom and we can expand that and um, there's no issues about having to sterilize flags planted on the front lawn and run away. Um, and if we expand the program beyond 360 flags, um, we've got a process um, in the works to expand that inventory and then if we need to, um, we could um, ask a community group if uh, they'd be willing to take that on. We pay them $6 a flag or whatever we decide and then we're sharing the, sharing the joy. So that is that. Any questions for me? No. <clears throat> Good, thank you. So I saw Dave Pickering coming out of the dog park uh, the other day. So we had a distance conversation. So um, possibly what we can do is combine charter night and changeover um, sometimes towards the end of June, if we're all able to get together and just combine those two, um, probably at the Sturgeon Valley, just to give them some business because they've lost so much business from us. So uh, that was just uh, literally on the trail system. Um, I don't think I have anything else. Does anybody else have anything that they want to bring to our attention? Um, I had a question. I'm not sure if um, uh, if Lynn has addressed this or not um, because I missed it the other week. But did we come to a consensus of um, our 30th anniversary project um, and what what what? are we going to do or are we going to do anything? Um, I know there was a lot of emails that came to myself uh, thinking that maybe that would be a, a revenue generating um, source if, if we could do something like a campground, um, but I don't know where that's at right now. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, there was some resolve at the executive meeting and the decision was that there will be no anniversary project at this time. It was recognized that all of these suggestions were great project ideas, all was really valuable. And going forward, uh, any project that starts really will need a champion to lead and bring forward to the club. And so we, re we remain open to that. Thanks, Jody. I think another thing we have to think of <clears throat> is there may be organizations within our community who really need cash after COVID, after the pandemic is finished. And maybe we do something with cash to some of these organizations instead of the type of project we had originally thought we might be doing. Okay, any other comments? There's lots of mute buttons on. Um, I'm just having a look who's here. Um, so if there's no other um, announcements or anything, it, it's time for the four-way test. Oh, John has something. John. You have a wine drop. 
Oh, yes, please. <laughs> I mean, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in, John. Online. Bob, well, pick me. And today's 50 50 is zero dollars. So, uh... <laughs> damn it, I never win. So, Myron, how is your hip doing? You're muted. Yes. You're unmuted now, Myron. Go. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> All right. My hip is doing well. I'm supposed to start back at work next Monday, part days, and then gradually increase. And then we'll go from there. Um, of course, huge impact with COVID. So our main goal is to contact each, each of our commercial clients in our portfolio and see what we can do to help them out with some, I guess, financial relief program. So it's gonna be busy when I get back next week. So yeah, it's been eight weeks and kind of looking forward to going back to work, but uh, yeah, it's uh, interesting times and uh, my thoughts are with you guys and uh, we'll get through it together. So this is good having this Zoom conference call, I think it connects people and that's important for the mental state. That's all I have to say. Okay. Um, are there any Rotarians that anybody knows of who need any help? Doug Webster is um, uh, in uh, self-isolation. He came back from Florida um, okay. and is quite sick, actually. So Doc Murdoch has been chatting with him. I've been chatting with him. He says he doesn't need anything. His family's helping him, but just keep him in mind. Okay. And are there any... And needs in the community that we need to look after at this point. Kathy, do you know of anything? Um, you know what? I, first of all, my dad refuses to stay home. He keeps going shopping, so I can't <laughs> can't stop him. Um, but no, I was at uh, the food bank yesterday. I got to say, I as I was walking around the corner, um, guess who I run into? Robert Gallant. Such a good guy. He, I guess the food banks. Um, refrigeration units had gone down. So of course, Robert has a refrigerated trailer. So he hauled it in, hooked it up and they're keeping all the cold food in Robert's trailer for now. Just such a good Rotarian. Uh, but I did talk to Susan. They have actually a fair amount of supply. They have a fair amount of cash on hand. Um, and sh she's just worried that a few weeks from now when when some of the EI starts writing out, their demand is gonna go up. So I think we can always probably contribute to the food bank. Um, she's more worried about the fact that they, they can't even go buy food because of the hoarding and the store shelves being empty, but they're managing. And um, I think we might be able to open up a temporary homeless shelter because I was talking to um, Jeremy Nixon, the MLA in charge of that last night and Dean Kerbwhite from the Mustard Seed said they could put 20 masks down on the floor. So that'll be the first time St. Albert's ever had a shelter for homeless. So, I mean, not, I don't want to, it's, 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 it's a positive for St. Albert that we might be able to get our foot into some homeless shelter funding, uh, maybe temporarily, maybe permanently. So that's actually good news. But the needs so far right now, I think are just that, that whole conversation about keeping everybody connected and community because the mental health is going to be the is going to be the biggest issue and supporting our local businesses. I think John's Facebook page is going to do a call out to everybody to do skip the dishes tonight and just try to support some of the kitchens that are still open. Well, and if you cannot do skip the dishes, if you're able to drive and you can order pickup, yeah. uh, that actually gives more money to the restaurant. Right. But it doesn't help to skip the dishes driver who's trying to get a get by as well. <laughs> I know, but <laughs> good um, point. Yeah. yeah. You know, half and half. <laughs> yeah. there, there's also, I just want to, I, I know about three Rotarians right now that their businesses have gone to zero for income wise. So uh, yeah, there's some serious things happening right now. And we're, we're talking about professionals too. We, the Chamber started a Support St. Albert Facebook page, and it's a place where you can um, do shout outs to businesses and just let people know which businesses are working um, and how their operations have changed. So, uh, in one day, we've got over a thousand followers, so hopefully that will grow and just keep putting positive thoughts there and helping our local businesses, right? 
The other thought that I've had is, um, yeah, it's great to go to Sobeys or Save On or what, whatever to get food that you need. But there are a lot of local, whether it be a greenhouse or the Hutterites who sell all kinds of food. You can get chickens and eggs and preserves and baking and all kinds of stuff from local. You don't have to go out to that to the Costco's of the world. There are other options. So I in like that's a lot of what we've done lately is we're staying away from Safeway and Sobeys. We're we've been out to the Hutterites to get a whole bunch of eggs and they are welcoming everyone. So you you don't have to have a pre-arranged relate relationship you can just go and show up and they will welcome you there so there are other options that are locally owned and they support them so just a food for thought darcy wanna... sorry darcy's meats have just hired more people so that's a good story so ian do you want to just send an email and tell people uh, which colony you've been working with um and where some of these su suppliers are that we can visit Absolutely, yeah. I'll send send out a, a a a list of them and ho hopefully links to their websites if they have them. I know there's a few greenhouses, but the biggest thing that I found is like if you want chickens and eggs, the Hutterites have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and they. So yes, I will send that out. It's a bit bit of a drive because the one that I go to is east of Fort Fort Sask. Um, so there is a drive involved, but there's a lot to be said about not being at home. You can still isolate inside your vehicle and show up and wipe your hands down and all of that. Um, the world is good, 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 good ahead as far as that's concerned. Um, yeah, the other thing is we, we went for a drive yesterday. We spent the whole day driving around, seeing what's out there. We're still inside our, our small little shell, the four windows of the vehicle, but you can totally go and do that and maybe buy some locally owned stuff. So that's what I found has helped our household. So, And I see we have Doug Webster with us. Yay, Looking. Doug! So how are you, Doug? You're on mute. I'm muted. I'm unmuted. Hi guys, how are you? I'm uh, I'm all right. I've got a booking for testing, uh, or um, I'm getting called for testing sometime today, hopefully. My little girl's uh, getting tested uh, later today because she's considered uh, emergency services. So uh, if she comes back, I know I positive. I know I'll come back positive. So I'm just sort of waiting it out and see what happens. Wow. So what, what do you need from us, Doug? Sorry, say that again. What do you need from us? What can we do for you? Oh, I don't need, I, I don't need anything. Thank you so much. We're, uh, we're in really good shape. You know, we've got uh, lots of family, uh, grandmas dropping stuff up outside. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it was, it's really, we're good. We're good. We've, we have a pretty good stock up of everything we need. So just, uh, you no, know, just, uh, I'm good. A hundred percent. You know, if I need anything, I'll be sure to say something else. Thank you. Thank you so much. And God, I'm ugly on this video. <laughs> so do you want us to keep going into staples and supporting you yeah you know it's 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 a funny time in the store i don't know if you've uh i know jen's quite aware of it but the store went to reduced hours so we're running uh 10 to 7 monday to friday and 11 to 5 on the weekends uh, we're limiting no more than 25 people into the store at a time um customers have been fantastic about it so it's it's almost like a one in one out. Uh, I haven't heard any complaints from any customers or from my staff about from customers about that. So I think people are pretty understanding. Um, my heart breaks that I can't be there, you know, so um, I am managing and doing a lot of work from home um, that I can to help out with the schools because the schools are like Crimson Sumners from uh, public's been in contact with me. Uh, we're doing everything we can to help the schools where we can as far as electronic uh, learning goes. Um, so we've got some things uh, hopefully going to come to fruition today to help them out. Um, but people are buying everything. And there's one of my biggest challenges on the electronics because there's no product available. Uh, nothing's come out of China in a long time. So uh, 
Chromebooks, laptops, our, our shelves, our, our, our lockups are almost bare now. Um, so we're relying on, you know, little shipments coming in whenever we can. Um, a lot of the cleaning supplies is really hard to get. We're hoping for actually a shipment should have come in for some yesterday. So trying to keep as many businesses up and running as we can is kind of the approach to it. So it's, it's really pretty inspiring when it's, it's not about the money part of it as much as trying to help people, you know, and, and students and schools stay, stay uh, operational the best we can. So it's, it's pretty cool to, it's pretty cool to see that happening in such, you know, crazy times that no one would ever have foreseen. So very, very uh, inspiring in many ways and very challenging in others. And God, I'm ugly on this video. <laughs> You're not looking your best, Doug, but... Uh... Yeah, Doug, yeah. you are ugly. Yeah, yeah. You're an ugly man, Doug. That's great. That's great. Well, let us, let us know how you get on and um, when you get tested and, um, yeah, yeah what, whatever we can do for you. So are there any other comments? Anybody else want to say anything? I just would like to say a big thank you again to Holly. So thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I guess it's, everyone. Um, yeah, so time's the four-way test. All right, we're we starting it. Of the I'll start. In the sand, do. Is, is it the, the truth? truth? Fair, fair, fair to all concerned. concerned. We'll build, 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 That really confused Zoom. <laughs> that, is, Thanks, guys. that is brutal. It just made me sicker. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye, guys. God bless. Bye, guys. Take care. Take care, take, take care guys. I need a lesson on Zoom. I've never done